So in this lecture, we're talking about constant modulus algorithm. But before I launch into the details of the constant modulus algorithm, I want to explain the example that I've chosen. And this example is a shaped pulse. And it's a QPSK signal, a binary signal in two independent branches in phase and quadrature. The QPSK signal goes from plus to minus 1. Uh, and of course, it has a modulus of each symbol exactly equal to 1. The shaping I'm going to be using is raised cosine pulse shaping. And this is typically used as a bandwidth strategy. If I use square pulses, they require a great deal of bandwidth. And this bandwidth may exceed that available in various components in the transmitter and receiver, which would introduce distortion. So in order to avoid worse distortion, I use a pulse-shaped signal. And uh, be because the shaping makes it occupy less bandwidth. Now, I'm going to use this raised cosine, and the raised cosine has a nice property that, in theory at least, at the sampling time of uh, the signal, at the uh, best sampling time, the optimal sampling time, that the, there should be no contributions to the intersymbol interference from adjacent pulses. So although these pulses occupy less, time, uh, less frequency, which means that they're going to occupy more space uh, in the time domain, that they'll actually overlap in the time domain. They have a nice structure so that the overlapping does not cause inter simple interference, again, in theory. Um, what's nice about raised cosine on top of it is that there's a nice, easy, one simple parameter to uh, make trade-offs in how realistic the zero ISI uh, criteria is and how much uh, frequency saving I have. So that's the reason we're going to use raised cosine. It's one that we see uh, quite often in the literature um, and in the laboratory. So again, QPSK with square pulses. Square pulses in the time domain mean that if I look at the spectrum in the frequency domain, that it would be a sync function. And that's the form that we see here. So the constellation is um, square waves, right? So it's square, square square, you know, there's each symbol is it's plus and minus one, right? So there's one value, so there's really four points. If I end up sampling this at one sample per symbol, and maybe the next one is a one, a zero, one, etc., um, then I could uh, bring together an eye diagram. If I had a continuous time eye diagram, of course, it would be like taking this pulse, lining it up here, taking this pulse, lining up here, adding all these together, and I would get something that looks like an eye diagram like this. Because I uh, am using one sample per symbol, my eye diagram is actually going to look a little like this. Sometimes when I sample, it's a plus one. Sometimes when I sample, it's a minus one. And the next interval here, it'd be a plus one or a minus one, and I just draw straight lines between them because it's one sample per symbol. But this is the one sample per simple eye diagram in phase and quadrature for QPSK with square pulses. Now let's consider what goes on with a 25%, a roll-off factor of 25% for the raised cosine. This is the one parameter I said that we could easily, excuse me, easily use to parameterize the trade-off in bandwidth and uh, intersimple interference. So this is what, in the time domain, a raised cosine pulse would look like. They look a little bit like a sync function. And here, at each pulse, there would be the optimal um, sampling time when this pulse is largest. And if we look, all the other pulses are going through zero when I'm sampling at the optimal time for that pulse, which is what we mean by this idea of zero intersimple interference. So if I, the reason that I use the um, raised cosine, the motivation is for its frequency domain behavior. And so here I've shown the spectrum of this uh, raised cosine pulse, and we can see that it occupies uh, less frequency than the uh, previous example of square waves in the time domain. Now, ideally, there's um, zero. Uh, uh, intersymbol interference. I'll say that in, in truth, there may be some uh, residual due to the fact that, of course, this takes infinite time 
for the pulse, and in the lab I have to truncate it to generate a realistic pulse. So there, there could be some intersymbol interference, but in theory it's that. Now because of the uh, shaping, instead of having one value, it's always plus or minus one, I'm putting it through this raised cosine filter in order to shape the pulse, and depending on the, the sequence that I'm sending, it's not always just plus and minus one depending on the sequence that goes through. So if I were to look at the constellation diagram, it would look something like this. There's no noise. It's just that if I only sample uh, at that instant, it might not be plus and minus one. That's an, an artifact of the shaping. It's, it's, it's not surprising. If I look at an oversampled eye diagram, uh, that would mean it would look like this. The transition from a negative one to a plus one, each one of these lines, it depends on what was the previous set of zeros and ones, and part of it is due to this fact that I'm using a truncated filter and it's not exactly zero ISI, so that's certainly one of the effects that we see here. Again, why do we call it an eye diagram? This is a little bit more obvious here that this actually looks like the form of a, a human eye, and it's a quick indicator of the quality of my signal. So if there are no transitions that are occurring here, then we say the eye is open, there's no no transitions here, and then I know that I will have reliable communications. If this ever closes, that I actually have transitions happening in the middle, why then of course I'm going to have very, very poor performance. So eye diagram is a simple way of getting a quick look at the quality of my signal. Ray's cosine has very good uh, frequency domain properties. So let's bring the two together so we can just uh, compare them. Uh, here, again, the eye opening is as big as it can be because it's absolutely plus one and minus one. Here, the average value here is plus one, and the average value here is minus one, but of course there's some thickness here, and because of that thickness, the eye opening is smaller in the case of the raised cosine. Now, I think in this linear scale for the frequency domain, it's not quite as obvious that we're having... Um, significant savings, and if we look at it in the uh, log scale, I think it's a little clearer that, that there's actually quite a bit less occupied bandwidth uh, with the raised cosine.